family vacation turns tragic when a pleasure yacht catches fire near the islands of southern Alaska. As the fire rages, a mother and daughter are missing. When the wreckage surfaces, evidence suggests the blaze was no accident. In Alabama, a young single mother suddenly disappears and her child is left behind. As investigators look for signs of foul play, patterns of guilt emerge. When killers know their victims, they rely on their intimate knowledge to pull off the perfect crime. But even the best laid plans leave traces of forsaken trust. Nestled between the Tongass National Forest and the Pacific Ocean, Sitka, Alaska is a picturesque fishing town in the southeastern part of the state. Its 9,000 residents enjoy a tranquil life in the safe and quiet sea community, where crime is the last thing on their minds. Air Station Sitka, but I have some force we can help you. On June 4, 1996, business owner Robert Meyer called the U.S. Coast Guard to report an accident. His 50-foot pleasure yacht had caught fire. His wife and daughter were missing. Now get the Red Hilo online. Get the Red Hilo online. Within minutes, a search and rescue operation was launched. The yacht was completely engulfed in flames, and it was sinking. Even in June, the Alaskan waters are cold. Rescue workers needed to act quickly if they hoped to rescue Diana and Chrissy Meyer. Coast Guard officials in Juneau notified the Sitka Police Department about the accident and that the mother and daughter were missing. Sergeant Darrell Rice went to the Meyer residence in the hopes of gathering any information to aid in the rescue efforts. Robert Meyer had returned home soon after he had phoned the Coast Guard. He was exhausted and distraught. He told the officer he had taken his family on a cruise around the islands just north of town. They left two days earlier. It was supposed to be their last outing together before his daughter Chrissy went away to college. Sergeant Rice asked about the trip. He responded that this was the most perfect weekend and it couldn't have been any better. Uh, we were having a great time. Meyer said that sometime around daybreak, he smelled smoke coming from the console. and that the floor above the engine room felt hot. Thinking the boat was on fire, Meyer said he rushed to get his family onto the small skiff and safely away from the flames. Realizing the family dog was still inside, Chrissy begged him to go back and rescue her. When he came back, his wife and daughter were gone. Meyer went on to say there were two to three foot swells in the waters. 
He believed his wife and daughter fell trying to get into the skiff. Sergeant Rice asked him if he needed medical attention. Meyer said that he had noticed a scrape on his leg. He must have gotten it as he left the boat. The search for the missing women continued. Search and rescue captain Don Kluting organized members from the Sitka Fire Department. We had actually lots of coverage. We had air coverage provided by the Coast Guard. We had water coverage provided by the Sitka Fire Department search and rescue teams, as well as private boats in the area. They followed the current, searching the water and shore for any sign of Diana or Chrissy. But with each passing hour, the rescue workers grew more concerned. Head east, conduct a shoreline search on up towards the inlet up here. Uh, cover the shore fairly good. We need to get a We're high calling point. out. We're using attraction um, as well as looking. The number one goal was, you know, to locate Diana and Christy Myers, which is always what our, our number one goal is. We were in, you know, search and rescue mode. We were doing a type two search, which is, you know, fairly thorough. We're looking for, you know, any types of evidence, things like that, as, as well as people on the beach. Rescue workers spotted a red object floating in the water. They retrieved the empty gasoline container. They noticed its cap was missing. The search continued for hours. But by mid-afternoon, rescue workers were running out of options. We searched the beaches uh, around the vicinity where the boat sank. We also uh, conducted shoreline searches, you know, from the boat. We um, covered and recovered the areas over and over again. We totally exhausted the search areas. The search for Diana and Chrissy Meyer lasted for over 24 hours. The rescue mission was now a recovery operation. The determination was made to, you know, suspend the mission pending further developments. Authorities continued to comb the shores, but now they were searching for bodies. They were also searching for wreckage of the burned yacht, most of which was now at the bottom of the ocean. Alaska State Trooper Randy McFerrin was called from Ketchikan to lead an investigation looking into the fatal accident. At a briefing, McFerrin viewed a tape of the burning yacht supplied by the Coast Guard. According to Robert Meyer, there were three-foot swells in the water when his wife and daughter were going from the yacht onto the skiff. But in the video, the water appeared calm. Okay. Sounds like he took off from Sitka on Sunday. He was also briefed on Meyer's weekend route the day before the fire. Instead of taking a safer, more inland route, Meyer took his family out into rougher seas. So why would somebody go out here where it's rough when it you come through here when it's nice and smooth? I don't know. Okay. That, that's a question. As the other officers brought him up to speed regarding the investigation, McFerrin noticed some inconsistencies in Robert Meyer's statements. Before they could proceed, a full set of transcripts of all interviews were ordered for comparison. Sergeant Darrell Rice went back to Robert Meyer's house, hoping he could shed some light onto how and why the fire started. Since Meyer had told him he was the first one to smell smoke, Sergeant Rice asked to see his clothes. He was looking for some clue as to the fire's origin. We were invited in the kitchen, and uh, there was a room adjacent to it, a little laundry room that had his clothing in it inside of a wash machine, and they reeked of uh, diesel fumes. Meyer explained that after he discovered the fire, he ran directly to the engine room, where he got some fuel on his clothes. 
the officer also asked to examine the 24-foot skiff. The boat was retrieved from the beach near Myers Marina and taken to a Coast Guard hangar. At the state crime lab, criminalist Walter McFarlane examined the clothing. He used ultraviolet light to detect evidence of hair or fibers, but found nothing significant. There was quite an odor of a, an assumerant or fuel present, and our main objective at that time was to get them into containers and protect it to save uh, that type of evidence. The clothing was preserved until they could be examined for the presence of accelerants or solvents. Sergeant Randy McFerrin and Daryl Rice combed through the transcripts, uncovering several inconsistencies in Meyer's statements. In one interview, he described how the electricity went out, then one engine, then another engine, and then he felt uh, fire below decks. In another interview, he said uh, the engine stopped and then the electricity went out. In one interview, he said his wife and daughter were asleep when the boat broke down. In another interview, he said they were awake. The next day, McFerrin hoped to clear up some of the discrepancies by speaking to Meyer personally. But Meyer suddenly would not cooperate and wouldn't talk to the investigator. He refused to speak to us unless his attorney was present, and we agreed to do that. Later that afternoon, we, we did a short interview, about half an hour long, with him with the attorney present before the attorney terminated the interview and told us to leave. Without further cooperation from Meyer, investigators turned to an examination of his boat. Meyer's 24-foot Carolina skiff was photographed and examined for possible damage, trace evidence, and blood stains. Just beneath the windshield on the cabin, he noticed a small red-colored stain. The stain was swabbed and a presumptive blood test was performed. The sample tested positive. They found blood. Preliminary forensic tests revealed the blood was of human origin. Now they needed to find out whose blood it was. Investigators were puzzled. They had two missing women and nothing more. And although there was very little evidence suggesting this was anything other than an accident, the only person who might supply answers now refused to talk. The only other place to look was on the yacht. And that was at the bottom of the ocean. Investigators in Sitka, Alaska began to suspect foul play in a boating accident. Diana and Chrissy Meyer were presumed dead. But they had no bodies and little forensic evidence. Businessman Robert Meyer still refused to speak with police or help in the investigation into the disappearance of his wife and daughter. Efforts to locate and extract the sunken yacht also met with repeated obstacles. While the sunken boat was initially thought to have landed on a ledge, divers and underwater cameras failed to locate the bulk of the wreckage. The boat was missing. The news of the accident spread through the small town of Sitka. If Robert Myers wouldn't talk to police, they soon discovered many would. At the Sitka police station, tips and additional information started to come in. Two days after the fire, lead investigator Randy McFerrin learned of insurance policies Meyer had taken out on his wife and daughter. They were for $500,000 each. 
Again, it's kind of suspicious, you know, number one. Why would you insure a teenager for five hundred thousand dollars? I mean, she's not a wage earner. They're dead, and now you're looking at getting a million dollars. Meyer also had complete replacement insurance on his fifty-foot yacht, listed on the policy as a Hatteras, a boat worth two hundred fifty thousand dollars. McFerrin needed to learn as much as possible about the Meyer family. Um, could you tell me what her relationship was like with her parents? Um. Seemed fine. She was really tight with her mother. Really One of Chrissy's friends told him that she was not aware of any family problems. And that to her knowledge, the Meyer family was close, especially Chrissy and her mother. Do you know if Christine could swim at all? Yeah, we have to take a test. When asked if Chrissy was a good swimmer, she said that Chrissy had taken lessons in school. And if you can think of anything more, please give me a call, okay? Contrary to Meyer's claim, his daughter not only could swim, but she completed an advanced course. McFerrin then spoke with a seasonal employee from Meyer's business. The employee said that Robert Meyer was acting strange in the days following Diana and Chrissy's disappearance. He didn't appear to be upset, and he had little input into his family's arrangements. She commented that Meyer had a short temper and would often snap and yell at employees. She had seen him fire and rehire employees several times in the four summers she worked for him. There were rumors of an affair between Meyer and one of his employees. A neighbor told the investigator she saw an employee come over to Meyer's residence several times when Diana and Chrissy were out of town. She said the woman would often stay until morning. Another curious piece of information came from a repairman who regularly worked on Meyer's yacht. The repairman told the investigator that the yacht was not a Hatteras like Meyer claimed but a less expensive look-alike Meridian yacht, difficult to tell apart. And it was not in the best condition. With rumors of an affair and indications of possible insurance fraud, circumstantial evidence surrounding Robert Meyer was mounting quickly. But without anything concrete, investigators knew it would be difficult to prove their case. They believed the forensic evidence they needed was buried deep within the submerged wreckage. Two weeks after the fatal fire, Meyer's clothing and the empty gas can were analyzed at the state crime lab in Anchorage. Criminalist Chris Beheim tested the clothing by attaching a small strip of activated charcoal on the lid of each can. charcoal would absorb any ignitable liquid. The cans were then placed into an oven and heated to speed up the process. Once that was complete, Beheim used a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer to separate the components and break down the complex mixtures. Petroleum distillates make a bell-shaped graph, which can be read and analyzed. Beheim concluded that the solvent in the empty gas can discovered at the site of the fire was the same as that found on Meyer's clothing. There were five clothing items uh, present in this case, and four of the items I detected the presence of fuel oil, something similar to kerosene or uh, a diesel fuel. The petroleum products that I detected in the Meyer case were all heavier in nature, not as volatile as, say, gasoline or lighter fluid. So they would tend to stay around longer and not evaporate as fast. On the surface, evidence was beginning to stack up against Robert Meyer. But investigators believed the strongest physical evidence still remained hidden somewhere at the bottom of the ocean. Unless the wreckage could be found and recovered, 
investigators knew there was little chance of ever proving their case. Detectives in Sitka, Alaska struggled to discover the truth behind a deadly fire that appeared to have claimed the lives of two women. Circumstantial evidence suggested foul play, and Robert Meyer was emerging as a suspect. Failed attempts to locate the burned yacht left investigators without solid physical proof. And the small town of Sitka did not have the resources necessary for a successful recovery. Two months after the investigation began, State Trooper Randy McFerrin received a fax from Alaska Fish and Game Authority. We found out a mini sub was going to be in the area doing uh, some research work, and we got a hold of them and asked us, asked them if they could work us in for a day, and they did. After an hour of searching the murky waters at a depth of 500 feet, McFerrin found what he was looking for. The superstructure and main deck had been totally consumed by the fire. But the engine room and a majority of the swim step appeared intact. To try to salvage the wreckage, McFerrin contacted the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms and enlisted the services of certified fire investigator George Barnes. Based on footage taken from the submarine, Barnes concluded that the best and perhaps only chance at salvaging the boat would be to try to bring it up by its two diesel engines. But they needed to wait until the early spring. The salvage operation was too difficult to attempt during an Alaskan winter. The operation was planned for March the following year. Using a crane barge from a company in Sitka, and a remotely operated vehicle supplied by the U.S. Navy, wreckage from Meyer's boat began to surface. Extensive corrosion and water damage had taken a toll on the yacht. The boat was so badly damaged we couldn't pick it up off the bottom. There was just nothing hard to grab onto. It's kind of like picking up a stick of warm butter. George Barnes was right about the engines. The salvage crew had something to grab onto, making lifting easier. And contrary to Meyer's theory, the engines were intact. His story was that the fire started as an engine room fire and progressed to eventually involve the whole vessel. When we recovered the engines, we noted that there was still paint uh, in considerable amounts on the engines. We also noted that there was also some hose attached to the uh, hose connections and uh, insulation on the electrical wiring that was recovered. Based on those observations, we concluded that the fire could not have started in the engine room as uh, Mr. Meyer had alleged. Investigator Barnes examined three pieces of a swim step that were recovered. He believed they would prove his theory that the fire started someplace other than the engine room. The wood appeared to be teak and had irregular burn patterns. The right or the starboard side of the swim step was severely damaged by fire, and the area nearest the vessel was severely damaged by fire, but the vessel itself was not uh, damaged in that same area. If he was correct and the wood was teak, Barnes knew it would have been difficult to burn. If the fire had started in the engine room, the distance between it and the swim step made the severe burn patterns found on the wood virtually impossible. Because teak wood burns so slowly, by the time the fire reached the swim step, the swim step would have been submerged and the damage would be minimal. Randy McFerrin had the wood tested to determine its type. Hi, George, it's Randy. Barnes was right. The wood was teak. To test his theory, George Barnes performed an experiment. Not only was the wood difficult to burn, as he suspected, but the location of Meyer's swim step was only six inches above water in calm conditions. 
Mr. Myers had claimed that the seas were three to four feet at the time of the fire, and we found it rather surprising, if not impossible, for this WIMP step to have exhibited uh, this type of fire damage when it's constantly being dunked in, in seawater uh, during these swells. Investigators also knew that without bodies, it would be difficult to determine the truth about the women's death. At the state crime lab in Anchorage, Payne Hamilton tried to extract DNA from a tiny blood stain found on Meyer's skiff. To do this, the scientist tried a new technology at the time called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. The former DNA analysis required as much stain as the size of a quarter. The newer PCR or polymerase chain reaction that we utilized required as little as the dot at the end of a sentence. The sample is mixed with chemicals and heated, then cooled in an instrument to break down, separate, and copy the DNA double helices. After 32 cycles of heating and cooling, the chain reaction of the new and copied DNA multiplied from a few to billions, all with unique genetic markings. Once the process was completed, Hamilton compared genetic markings and was able to conclude that the blood could not have belonged to Robert Meyer or his daughter. But investigators had no way of getting a blood sample from his wife, Diana. Using blood supplied by her biological parents, Hamilton was able to perform a reverse paternity test. The probability that the blood on the skiff was Diana's was over 99%. In one of his early statements, Bob Meyer said that if any blood was on the skiff, it would have been his. He claimed that he cut himself boarding the skiff on, on the, it had an external gas tank, and he cut his leg, and that that blood would have been his. McFerrin believed this was the evidence he needed to arrest Robert Meyer. Although the bodies had not been recovered, investigators now believe that Meyer had murdered his wife and daughter sometime during their weekend together. He then doused his yacht with gasoline and deliberately set it on fire to make it look like an accident. But days before Robert Meyer was due before a grand jury, he was suddenly injured in a car accident. He broke his neck and was paralyzed from the neck down. When this occurred, we were making plans to take this case to the grand jury here in Sitka and uh, so basically put everything on hold. We are just waiting to see if he was going to survive from his injuries or not. He did survive. He returned to Sitka to face the hearing, confined to a wheelchair. The grand jury handed down indictments, charging Meyer with two counts of murder in the first degree, two counts of murder in the second degree, arson, tampering with physical evidence, and two counts of scheme to defraud. But Meyer would never face a criminal trial. A few months before he was to appear in court, Robert Meyer's body was discovered in shallow water off the end of a dock. After a thorough investigation, investigators concluded he had taken his own life. Robert Meyer planned and successfully executed the murders of his wife and daughter. But in the end, submerged forensic evidence proved his guilt. In Alabama, investigators were up against a very different crime scene that left many clues, but few possible suspects. Birmingham, the state's largest metropolitan city, prides itself on its blend of modern sophistication and traditional Southern hospitality. On the morning of May 19, 1992, a landlord stopped by one of his rental properties. His plan was to repair his tenant, Candace Brown's, broken fence. 
He had just arrived when he saw glass from a broken window pane. He also noticed a cut telephone line. Concerned for the safety of the young single mother, the landlord went to the front door to check on her. Candace! But no one appeared to be home. Candace! The landlord immediately went to a neighbor's house and phoned police. When officers arrived, they discovered a two-year-old boy sitting alone in a bedroom. But there was no sign of Candace. Afraid that she might have been the victim of a kidnapping or worse, the officers knew they had to find her as quickly as possible. Detectives and volunteers set out to search the neighborhood and the nearby woods. The canine unit was brought in to help find the young mother. As the search continued, Candace's house was processed for clues. Although the phone line was cut and the window was broken, there was nothing inside suggesting robbery and no signs of visible struggle. This puzzled veteran homicide detective Steve Corvin. Inside the home, we found very little evidence. Nothing was disturbed. The house wasn't ransacked. There didn't appear to be anything missing. Outside, forensic investigators photographed and bagged the broken pieces of glass. The broken window was the point of entry. And there was another potential clue. Hey, detective, I think we got something over here. A shoe print discovered on one of the pieces of glass showed visible and distinct markings. The freshly cut phone line was also removed and taken as evidence. As investigators continued their search of the house, Candace Brown's parents arrived to take the little boy. They had no idea what could have happened to their daughter. They had just seen her the night before. Candace left her son at their house while she went out for a few hours. When she came to pick him up, she asked if they would follow her home. Her parents said that she had been nervous lately. Her home was burglarized a week earlier, and she was afraid to go into a dark house alone with her son. But after turning on the lights, she smiled and waved them off. Candace's parents told detectives their daughter was outgoing and worked as a volunteer at a church ministry. She regularly visited a local minimum security prison known as an honor farm, where she counseled residents. As officers tried contacting the ministry, Detective Corvin spoke to her neighbors. One neighbor said she saw something suspicious. She looked out the window the night before and noticed a man in an unfamiliar vehicle parked outside Candace's house. Although she didn't get a good look at the driver, she described the car as a white Honda Accord. Several hours had passed and the searchers still had not found Candace. To get more accurate information on the shoe print found outside Candace Brown's house, the glass was sent to the State Department of Forensic Sciences lab. Forensic examiners analyzed the print to try to determine the size and make of the shoe.
the pieces of the cut phone line were also examined. Technicians hoped that the particular cut in the line would help them identify the type of tool used to sever the wire. With the results still inconclusive, Detective Corvin visited the Honor Farm. Candace's parents gave the detective the name of an inmate that was an old friend of hers. The friend told the detective that he and Candace went to high school together. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, when in there is where they met. And, and that Candace regularly came to the Honor Farm to visit him. The friend also said he introduced Candace to another resident. Michael Land came to two or three meetings with Candace and seemed interested in her ministry and her desire to help him get back on track. He went on to say that since Michael Land had been released already, he had asked him to go check up on Candace for him. I just hope he can figure it out because... Detective Corbin performed a background search on Land and discovered he had been in prison before. With Candace Brown still missing and time running out, detectives felt they now had a potential lead. And they set out to find Michael Land. Detectives in Birmingham, Alabama were investigating the suspicious disappearance of Candace Brown. It had been more than two days, and with each passing hour, the hopes of ever finding the young mother alive faded. So far, the most promising lead was a known felon named Michael Land, who Candace counseled in prison. Detective Steve Corvin tracked down Land, who was working for a local construction company. We told him that Candace Brown was missing, and we'd like to talk to him about her disappearance. say we suspected him of anything. We just uh, thought he might be helpful. Michael Land volunteered to go with the detective to the police station. While being tape recorded, Michael Land explained to the detective how he met Candace Brown at the Honor Farm. He said that they were introduced through a mutual friend and had developed a friendship. He also said he went to visit her after he was released. With the tape still rolling, Michael Land denied having any knowledge about Candace's whereabouts. Well, she would come in. On the night of her disappearance, Land claimed to have been at his girlfriend's house. It was more really he said that he slept in his car outside her house that night and was nowhere near Candace's. But at one point during the interview, the detective noticed something suspicious. While Land was talking, he crossed his legs. The print on the bottom of his shoes looked similar to the print found on the broken piece of glass. To rule out Land as a suspect, the detective asked if he could examine the rest of his clothing. As Michael Land changed into jail clothes, the detective had his story checked out. A police officer went to visit Land's girlfriend at her house. She claimed that she did not see Michael Land at all the day before. And that to her knowledge, he had not slept in his car outside her home. Land's shoes and clothes were sent to the police lab where they were examined. The clothes provided no clues, but forensic scientist Phyllis Rowland found several stains around the toe of the tennis shoe that looked like blood. In looking for stains and identifying them as blood stains, I will visually look at the item of evidence for primarily reddish brown stains or stains that might look like blood and remove a very, very small amount of those stains and use a chemical test 
to determine whether they give a reaction that is indicative of blood. The blood found on the shoes was human. Detective Corbin confronted Michael Land, and Land asked the detective to turn off the tape recorder. He wanted to come clean. Land admitted to breaking into her house a week earlier, but claimed he didn't take anything. He then said that on the night of Candace's disappearance, he ran into two guys named Tony and Edward. Tony and Edward wanted to know if he knew of any easy places to rob, and Land told him about Candace's. He said that he went with them, but that the two guys started to get rough with Candace. He confessed that the blood on his shoes happened when one of the guys gave Candace a bloody nose. But after things started to get violent, he got scared and left. He had an answer for everything until we started being able to show that there was inconsistencies with what he was telling. Then he would make up something to cover that. He said that one of the guys slapped her to the floor and bloodied her nose. And we said, well, we didn't find any blood on the floor. There was still some hope that Candace was alive. Investigators asked Land for the keys to his car. Not knowing what they might find, the officers got verbal authority from the district attorney to open the trunk. With Land still at the police station, the detective went to examine the car. Inside the trunk, they found a pair of wire cutters and a 45 caliber gun. But no sign of Candace. The car was impounded while they waited for an official warrant. The detective had enough to hold Michael Land for 48 hours while evidence could be processed and an arrest warrant issued. Police still didn't know what had happened to Candace, but they feared the worst. We had come to the conclusion that she was probably dead, but we had no idea where to look. He didn't admit that he had harmed her in any way. And his uh, only connection to it was that he was there with two men. The very next morning, two boys had skipped school and were hiking near a quarry on Ruffner Mountain. They made a shocking discovery. Partially hidden in some trees, was the body of a dead woman. Detectives were called to the scene and photographed the body. Detective Corvin recognized the body as Candace Brown. She had been shot once in the head, and there was evidence of possible sexual assault. After days of searching, detectives' worst fears were confirmed. A young mother was dead, and all the evidence seemed to point directly at Michael Land. And now, detectives needed proof. Police in Birmingham, Alabama, were now investigating a homicide. The body of Candace Brown, a young mother, was found in the nearby woods. And all of the evidence pointed to Michael Land, and the detectives now needed to prove he was a killer. At autopsy, it was confirmed Candace had died as a result of a single gunshot wound to the head. The bullet was removed and sent to the ballistics lab. There was also evidence of sexual assault. Although Michael Land admitted he broke into the house, he maintained two other individuals attacked Candace. Land referred to them only as Tony and Edward. Detective Steve Corvin suspected he might be lying. We didn't believe that these men were real to begin with. When somebody gives you a real generic name and, 
and they just met them and that sort of thing, you you know that it's it's pretty pretty much fictional. Forensic examiners made a print of Land's shoes. It was then measured against the print found on the glass. They concluded there was only one perpetrator in the house, and the prints at the crime scene matched the shoes worn by Land. At the state forensic lab, Phyllis Rowland examined the clothing Candace was wearing to try to determine where she was murdered. I retrieved the shirt that was identified to be from Candace Brown and looked at the bloodstain patterns that were present on it and determined that uh, she was shot where she was found. And in doing so, looked at the back of the shirt and found biological stain there, which was actually a semen stain. The stain was removed and tested for DNA. Using the available method of DNA fingerprinting, Phyllis Rowland was able to match the blood found on Land's shoe to Candace Brown. She also matched the semen stain to Michael Land's DNA. The only thing left to do was to confirm the 45 caliber weapon found in the trunk of Land's car was the actual gun used to murder Candace. Ballistics experts conducted tests using Land's 45. The spent bullet was checked against the one taken from Candace's body. There was a match. Armed with overwhelming evidence, Michael Land was placed under arrest. Detectives determined Land acted alone that night. After cutting the phone line, Michael Land broke the window and entered the house. He then kidnapped Candace Brown, leaving her two-year-old son still sleeping. Because the murder was committed during a kidnapping and burglary, Michael Jeffrey Land was convicted of two counts of capital murder and sentenced to die. When killers strike those they know, they shatter the bonds of confidence and trust. But for detectives and forensic investigators, it is often the evidence of that forsaken trust that helps bring the murderers to justice.